Okay. Well, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter, the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program is part of a weekly series that we've launched as a way to share information about particular objects in our collection while our building is closed because of the corona crisis. And uh, let me add a, um, a wish for health and safety for all of you out there and to thank you for your support uh, of this program. Um, let me just... Uh, before I start with my presentation, I wanna encourage you to pose any questions you have on the Q&A uh, button on the bottom part of the screen. If you scroll your mouse over the bottom part of the screen, you should see Q&A. And if you type in your question, I will try and respond to it either while I'm talking or at the end of my presentation. Okay, so today I would like to focus on this. Um, this is a, an item in our second gallery. It is God Goldman's Working Papers from the Lodge Ghetto, which were donated to our museum by God Goldman's daughter, Marilyn Schneider, as part of a larger collection of materials that her father had held onto after the war and protected over the years. Marilyn told me that her father had been a reserved and quiet man who never showed these documents to her or her brother Michael when they were growing up, but which they discovered when he passed away in 2007. Um, donated, sorry, by Marilyn and her brother and her family. Um, the entire collection, including the document I'm gonna talk about today, is invaluable as a tool to understanding how the Holocaust happened. We are grateful to Marilyn Schneider and her family for donating these papers, and I hope today to give a sense about this one document's importance for our museum and for the larger goal of never forgetting. While it may not be able, not be easy to tell from this one slide, this is a pretty small piece of paper, about six inches wide by five inches high. Um, perhaps this larger view of our display in the museum will give you a better sense of its size. It's a bit larger than a postcard, but designed to be folded in half and carried in a pocket. And it was never anything more than a fragile piece of paper, easily torn or crumpled. The fact that it survived the war is a testament both to its importance and to God Goldman's tenacity. Let's look at it more closely. The title document on the right-hand side says that this is an identif identification card issued by the Ghetto Employment Office, and we are talking about the ghetto in Lichmannstadt, uh, as it says on the bottom. Litzmannstadt was the name that the Nazis gave to the Polish city of Lodz, one of the biggest industrial centers in Poland in 1939, with a pre-war population of around 670,000, one third of whom were Jews. The Nazis launched their invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939, and by September 8th, they had taken Lodz. By November of that year, Lodz was annexed to the Reich, and made part of Germany as distinct from other parts of Poland that were incorporated into the general government, which is shown here in the kind of pale yellow color, or annexed to the Soviet Union, shown here in green. With the annexation, the Nazis renamed the city after Karl Litzmann, a German general from World War I who had later joined the Nazi party, but had died in 1936, three years before the war. The Nazis' choice to honor Litzmann was part of a larger effort that sought to overturn the German defeat of World War I. General Litzmann had led the German victory in 1914 in the World War I Battle of Lodz, where the Germans defeated the Russians and took control of the city. Of course, regardless of that victory in 1914, when Germany surrendered at the end of the war in 1918, the Versailles Treaty incorporated Lodz into the newly restored nation of Poland. German troops in Lodz were disarmed by the local population in 1918, and Lodz became a Polish city. Calling the city Lichmannstadt in 1939 
was an effort to roll back history and to suggest what would have been if the Germans hadn't lost the, world, the war in World War I. In 1940, after the full occupation of Lodz and the rest of Poland, the Nazis started a policy of containment and deportation. The goal of genocide was not yet fully developed. That would come later. Instead, the immediate goal was to make Germany free of Jews, to deport all the Jews in Germany, including those in the newly annexed city of Lodz, to the region to the east. And the first step in that plan was to register and then centralize Jews in ghettos where they could be held until deportation. On February 8, 1940, the Germans ordered that all the Jewish residents of Lodz had to live on specifically designated streets in the old city. Over the next two months, Jews were forced to crowd into the limited space available and barricades went up to separate the Jews from the rest of the city. You see here a photo of the Jews moving into the ghetto, walking past this building here, one of the great synagogues of Lodz that was later destroyed. On the night of April 30th, 1940, 80 years ago tomorrow, the Nazis closed the gates of the ghetto in Lodz. You see here a map of Lodz with the ghetto superimposed over it to give you a sense of where the ghetto was, essentially just north of the center of the city in the oldest part of the city. While some of the Jews had escaped from Lodz before the ghetto was locked, the ghetto was initially home to about 160,000 Jews, making it the second largest ghetto in Europe, behind the Warsaw Ghetto. The Nazis then began to deport, to deport Jews from the surrounding area into the Lodz Ghetto, and then expanded the catchment area, sending Jews from as far away as Luxembourg to Lodz. To organize the Jewish community and maintain order in the ghetto, the German authorities established a Jewish council in Lodz, a Judenrat. The Nazis then appointed Chaim Romkowski to head the Jewish council, a 62-year-old man who'd run an orphanage in Lodz before the war and had been an insurance agent. Romkowski reported directly to the Nazi administrator, Hans Bibo, the gentleman on the right in this photo, and was granted unprecedented powers to maintain order in the ghetto. He ran the ghetto police. He provided the lists of who would be deported to the Nazis. When the Nazis dissolved the rabbinate, Romkowski performed weddings, and his face was even put on postage stamps used in the ghetto, leading Romkowski to be known sarcastically as King Chaim. To ensure that there was no contact between the Jews and non-Jews in Lodz, two German police battalions were assigned to patrol the perimeter of the ghetto, while Romkowski's Jewish police force worked from within to prevent escape and maintain order. Here you can see the Nazi police in the foreground and dressed in black, but the Jewish policeman is in the light colored jacket and has a Jewish star on his left arm. God Goldman, the man whose working papers we, we, papers we have on display, later described life in the ghetto in both an oral history and in several written statements. He described the crowding with families of six or even 10 people all forced into a single room with people sleeping on the floor because that was the only space available. He described the lack of heat in the winter and the inadequate clothing. But the worst thing he said was the shortage of food. Everything he wrote was rationed and even then only when the Germans decided to give it out. Under those kinds of conditions, almost 10,000 people died of starvation and disease in the first six months after the ghetto was established. God Goldman also wrote about efforts to resist and fight back in the ghetto. He described one escape action where 10 Jews managed to get out. A few hours later, however, nine were returned under heavy guard. They'd gotten past the German soldiers uh, and police, but Polish residents delivered them back to the Gestapo in exchange for food and to save their own lives. The next morning, God wrote, without benefit of trial, judge, or jury, the nine were hanged in the middle of the ghetto street. What happened to the tent, he never knew. It was in this atmosphere that Chaim Robkowski 
embraced the idea that if the Jews in the ghetto provided something of value to the Nazis, then they would be saved and the living conditions would improve. With that in mind, he pushed ghetto residents to work 12-hour days in abysmal conditions and on starvation diets to produce uniforms, clothes, furniture, and electrical, electrical equipment for the German military. By 1943, 95% of the adults in the ghetto were employed in some 117 workshops. In maps of the ghetto like this one, you can see the dozens of black dots that mark the location of ghetto factories. And indeed, partially because of the productivity of the Lodz ghetto, the Nazis did not fully liquidate the ghetto until August of 1944, long after other ghettos had been empty. That is not to say, however, that all the Jews in the Lodz ghetto survived until August of 1944. At the end of December 1941, more than 18 months after the ghetto had been established, the Nazis ordered the Judenrat to select 20,000 residents of the ghetto to be deported to an undisclosed camp. After much debate and argument, the Judenrat came up with a list of 10,000 people, half the number that the Nazis had asked for, but who the Judenrat identified as criminals or people who were either unable or unwilling to work. Unbeknownst to those in the ghetto, those 10,000 Jews were taken to the first of the Nazi death camps located in Chelmno, about 30 miles north of Lodz, where they were murdered. Another 30,000 were deported to Chelmno in February of 1942, 11,000 more in May, and 15,000 in September of that year. By the time of the deport deportations in September of 1942, Romkowski and the Judenrat had realized that the deported Jews were being killed, as their clothing and other general possessions were being returned to Lodz for processing. The remaining Jews in Lodz began to suspect the deportations meant death, but they did not realize that there was the larger Nazi plan to murder all the Jews of Europe. In September of 1942, when the new German order demanding 24,000 Jews be handed over for deportation, Romkowski made a choice that remains a source of anger today. Convinced that the only chance for Jewish survival was in showing the Nazis how productive they could be, Romkowski called on ghetto families to bring forward their elderly relatives and their children. In a speech that is hard to read, Romkowski announced the following. He said, a grievous blow has struck the ghetto. The Germans are asking us to give up the best we possess, the children and the elderly. I never imagined I, he said, would be forced to deliver this sacrifice to the altar with my own hands. In my old age, I must stretch out my hands and beg. Brothers and sisters, hand them over to me. Fathers and mothers, give me your children. A frightening speech. Despite the horror, parents had little choice but to turn over their children for deportation. Some families committed collective suicide to avoid the inevitable. The ghetto population, which had included 160,000 people in May of 1940, stood at only 84,000 by the end of December 1942. Deaths and deportations had cut the Jewish population in half. Almost 80,000 people murdered from this one ghetto by December of 1942. One thing became clear by the September deportation of 1942, if it had not been apparent before, and that was that survival in Lodz depended on the ability to work, which brings me back to the working papers in our exhibition. I'll come back to this front side in a minute, and more about the story of God Goldman, but I wanted to also show you the back of this document, which we're not able to display in our gallery. You can see, even without reading German, that the right-hand page appears to be a warning. The top line says, pay close attention. And then it has four particular warnings or instructions. First, keep this card legible. Second, don't alter it. Third, keep it with you at all times. And fourth, uh, the card was not transferable. It was for the person who it was given to originally only. And then at the bottom, it's signed by the Nazi ghetto administrator, Bibo. 
Even more imp important, particularly given the situation in Lodz, was the language on the left side with the heading, worker, consider this. When the, the crucial line at the beginning of the section on the left-hand side says, whoever does not have a worker's card will be considered unemployed. And it goes on with how to get a replacement card. But the bottom line is, without this card, you are liable for deportation. Which, of course, in this case, also meant death. This was the card that Chaim Rumkovsky, the head of the Judenrat, believed all Jews needed to have in order to show that the ghetto would be productive. Possession of this card was what stopped you from being added to his lists. In short, this card is what saved you from being killed, or at least delayed it. There's a question that somebody posed here about whether the survivors uh, into 1943 was the largest proportion of survivors from a ghetto and whether historians do believe that uh, Romkowski's collaboration helped the ghetto survive. And I'm not sure if it's the largest percentage, but historians do believe that the productivity of the ghetto had an impact in why it lasted so long and why it was kept so long. Um, getting back to the card, the card on display in our museum, as I said, was owned by God Goldman. And the smiling photo somewhat belies the conditions in the ghetto and the fear that God Goldman had every day. Before I talk about the other information of the card, let me say a word about his name. The Nazis wrote God, G-O-D, as his first name, which may look strange to us. Recall, however, that God Goldman would have spoken Yiddish, and in Yiddish, his name would have been spelled with Hebrew letters, uh, either Gimel Dalet or Gimel Aleph Dalet. When transliterated, you could put an O or an A in the middle, and the Nazis put an O. Were they trying to be funny, giving a Jew who they saw as subhuman the name God? Perhaps, but given that the German word for God is Gott, it seems more likely that the person filling in the form thought God, G-O-D, sounded more like the name as God pronounced it in front of him that day. Let me just see. Um, God's daughter Marilyn told me that when God moved to America, his paperwork also said God, G-O-D, Goldman, and it was both annoying and embarrassing. She said they used to get prank phone calls at their home from people saying that they were Jesus and they wanted to speak to God, because in the phone book, their number was listed as God Goldman. She even got in trouble once at school when she wrote on some forms that her father's name was God, G-O-D, but when she asked her teachers to check the phone book, the punishment was rescinded. Eventually, after much urging from both Marilyn and her brother Michael, God Goldman legally changed his name to God, G-A-D, Goldman. Back to the card. In addition to his name, you can see other information that's here on the document. It shows his birthday, and you'll note here that he's 27 years old when the ghetto was sealed in 1940. So a young and healthy and single man, which helped him to survive. The card also shows his address in the ghetto and it shows his work address. It says he worked as a, in a clothing workshop at 70 Hohenstein, Hohenheiner Strasse. And it says that he was a magaziner or worked in the stock room or a warehouse. There are two other lines on the front. One has a place to write in the date when his employment starts. And the other line says he is allowed to cross the street within the ghetto even after the curfew. This last line is a reminder that the Jews were under military rule in the ghetto. They were watched constantly, restricted in everything they could do, and if you were outside after the curfew without a card like this, that alone could be death. So this little line of text is a hint of what life was like in the ghetto. Let me say one more thing about his work address, 70 Hohensteinerstrasse. 
you may be familiar with Hohensteiner Strasse, or at least have seen a picture of it. This is the photo that we have in our museum, where you can see the kind of famous footbridge that was built by the Nazis to span Hohensteiner Strasse. The, re the reason for the footbridge was simply because Hohenheiner Strasse was one of the main arteries through Lodge. In this map of the city, you can see Hohenheiner Strasse is highlighted in yellow. And you can see we're talking about a major artery that ran right through the center of the city and included a significant streetcar line. When the Nazis decided to establish the ghetto, they couldn't avoid the street but they also didn't want to give Jews access to it. Initially, after the ghetto was sealed, but before the bridges were built, Jews who had to cross from one section of the ghetto to another had to wait at key crossing points that were watched by the police to make sure nobody used them to escape the ghetto. In fact, if you look back at this photo that I showed before of the police, this is, I believe, actually one of those crossing points before the bridges were built. You can see the Jews are gathering and are being stopped from coming onto the street until it's deemed safe or of no inconvenience to the non-Jewish residents on the street. But eventually, as you can see on this map, the Nazis decided that building pedestrian bridges across Hohenheiner Strasse would reduce the chance of Jews escaping and better enforce the separation that the Nazis wanted. Let me say a couple of other comments about this card and God Goldman. First, God was one of the Jews who were deported from their hometowns to Lodz. His family was not from Lodz, but from Kalish, located about 80 miles west of Lodz. But once the ghetto was built, as I mentioned, Jews from the surrounding area and even other countries were funneled into it. Second, the fact that he is listed as working in a clothing factory or shop is representative of much of the work done in Lodz. The city had become a center of the textile industry before the war, and the Nazis took advantage of the factories there to produce uniforms and other clothes for the German military. In general, the Nazis turned to slave labor throughout occupied Europe to produce materials for their war effort, and Lodz was no different. And third, it may not seem that being a stockkeeper or working in the stockroom was such a crucial job, but we know from God's daughter Marilyn and God's own testimony that God, God Goldman was quick on his feet and that that is what it took to survive. Getting food and staying off the deportation list, particularly as the ghetto population shrank, became not only about work but about connections. God, partially because of his age and partially because of his character, was able to make those connections and was good at foraging for food. Several times his family was placed on the deportation list, but he used his contacts and his charm to get them taken off. Eventually, uh, nothing could save God and his family, and they were deported to Auschwitz in August of 1944. His parents were immediately sent to the gas chamber, but he and one of his sisters were selected for work. God was lucky in some ways to arrive in Auschwitz so late. Because of growing concerns about the war, the Nazis stopped using the gas chambers in November of 1944 at Auschwitz, only a little over two months after God had arrived. Of course, conditions were horrendous. His life was in danger every day. But the approaching Red Army changed the dynamic in Auschwitz. As part of the emptying of the camp, God was sent west, eventually to a concentration camp near Schottenburg, Germany, where he would later be liberated. He was then moved to a displaced persons camp at Fornwald, where he would meet his future wife, Sylvia. We have a photo in our exhibit in the area that we talk about displaced persons camps of God and his wife, Sylvia, who sits to his right in this photograph in Fornwald. You can recognize his face from the ghetto working papers. His smile is infectious, yet hides a world of pain that I struggle to comprehend. His parents, two brothers and one sister had been murdered. He and one sister were the only family members to survive. God and Sylvia eventually moved to New York in 1951, settling in the Bronx and later moving to Far Rockaway. He ran several businesses and then spent most of his career working in the finance 
department for the Orthodox Union. He passed away after a full and remarkable life in 2007, and his wife followed four years later. His daughter, Marilyn, settled in Great Neck, connecting the family's history to Nassau County and our museum. Let me conclude my talk today by quoting something that God Goldman wrote in one of his written accounts of life in the ghetto. He said, it is very painful for Holocaust survivors to repeat these stories, but the stories must be told. We tell the story because it is our obligation. We were there when our brothers went to the gas chamber. How we escaped, we don't know. And they told us that whoever survived should tell the story to the world. All people who know about it have the obligation to tell the stories. You must tell the next generation, I heard it from a survivor. He told me what happened to him, so it should never happen again. We are honored to have God Goldman's material in our collection as we continue to tell and retell the history of the Holocaust. I'm gonna stop there and answer some of the questions you've posed. Let me also remind you of some of our other upcoming programs. On Sunday, this coming Sunday at one o'clock, Professor Elisa Solomon from Columbia University is gonna be presenting a program about the success and abiding power of Fiddler on the Roof. Next Wednesday, I will be offering another Curator's Corner looking at a letter that approved the departure from Europe for one person to come to the United States. And on Tuesday, May 12th, we will be offering our first of two virtual tours of our museum during the month of May. You can find a full list of our programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. And if you're a user of social media, please use the hashtag learn at home or museum at home. One last item, I ask you to make a donation to support programs like today's talk by clicking on, clicking on the Give Now tab on the top right corner of our website. We rely on your donations to keep our programs going, particularly at this difficult time. Okay, I see a couple of questions. Let me see what I can answer. Um, do you know at what age Jews were entitled to obtain work permits? I, I'm sorry, Gail, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'll have to look that up, thank you. Where were the Poles who lived in the ghetto area relocated to when the ghetto was established? Uh, the, any residents who were in that area were just forced out of their homes. They weren't actually given new places to live. The Nazis just generally forced those people out and said, you've got to go find some place else. Okay, well, thanks very much for listening today and I hope you have a pleasant afternoon and I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs very soon. Thank you.